please join me in welcoming Dr. George Church. Thank you very much. I will be making some uh, forward-looking statements. Uh, since future is in the title of my talk, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm advocating them or that I am uh, optimistic. It, it means that in order to do engineering long-term planning, you need to think about, and, and cautionary tales are in order, like building a cathedral, you might have to plan a century in advance. This is my conflict of interest slide. Uh, I'm highly conflicted. Uh, but it's also this is a set of institutions, both nonprofit and for-profit, that help us bring our technology into reality, into, the, into uh, daily life. These are some of the topics that we'll talk, mainly the top three, which is this idea of synthetic versus natural uh, prediction um, and uh, where we stand in terms of human genome engineering. We have a, a love affair with the idea of the natural, even though we as a species are about as unnatural as you can imagine. We have, I'll, I'll mention four diseases. There's diabetes and heart disease, which are, which, to which we succumb due to natural compounds such as sucrose and cholesterol. And the source of uh, carcinogens are, are robust in nature. Uh, we uh, get on the order of uh, 1,500 milligrams a day of, of plant uh, toxins and, and pesticides that are listed as rodent carcinogens. Um, so that's the cancer side. And the infectious disease side is there are many instances where uh, infectious agents are spread through uh, vegetables and uh, meats. We have uh, a huge difference of, a, of uh, intention and, and uh, obsession with risks. The risks of genetically modified foods are not well documented. The risks of driving a car are very well documented, 1.2 million deaths a year. Uh, my, my laboratory and my obsession is about safety and building uh, engineering safety. It's not just a matter of saying we want the world to be safer. We have to create technology. And here's some of the technologies that we use for automobiles. Uh, I, I, you know, it doesn't sound like we've done our job entirely if there's still 1.2 million deaths a year, but these are the sort of things that inspire us to do better in a variety of engineering fields, including uh, genome en engineering, which is what we're talking about here. We have standards and testing in biology increasingly. We have, uh, you know, these redundant systems and isolation that we're using, physical, genetic, and metabolic. Uh, I have advocated that we do uh, extensive education, licensing, and surveillance uh, since 2004, in particular in the field of synthetic biology. Since the technology uh, is getting exponentially uh, less, ex less expensive, more uh, able to engage the, the public through do-it-yourself biology, I, f I felt then and feel now that we need to have better and better tools for tracking uh, the dissemination of the information, the chemicals, and the instruments. Here's just a snapshot from the, the trenches in the laboratory. We're trying to address what it is that, that people want when they say that they want uh, organisms, that, genetically engineered organisms that do not spread in the wild. This is one of the uh, many critiques of uh, genetically modified uh, uh, organisms, and this is uh, one uh, attempt that we've recently uh, published where we make them genetically isolated, metabolically isolated, even if they, uh, whether or not they're physically isolated from the environment, they cannot exchange genetic material successfully. So uh, let's talk about prediction. Um, these were forward-looking uh, statements. Uh, where uh, New York Times, I have nothing against the New York Times, uh, Amy, uh, but uh, back in, in 1903, they made the modest prediction that it would be one to 10 million years, a nice broad range uh, for a flying machine. And uh, even Wilbur Wright, who, who was much closer to the event than the New York Times, perhaps, uh, was off by about uh, 48 years in his estimate. And so we make, we make such mistakes, and, and, uh, 
and even within my field, <coughs> my fields uh, of, of computing and uh, biology, we have these two trend lines, sometimes called Moore's Law. It's not really a law, it's a trend. It could deviate from the line at any point. The blue line, which was, biology, was various biological things, sequencing and synthesis, reading and writing DNA, it followed the, the electronics Moore's Law line at about 1.5 fold per year for many years. And so it seemed like, wow, this must really be a law that's totally general biology and electronics. Uh, but then we blew it and we went way off the reservation and it took not six decades to bring us down to an affordable genome, but more like six years. So we're, we're down around a thousand dollar cost. We don't yet have a thousand dollars that you can, you know, go out and individually get genomes, but it's uh, at bulk rate that's where we are right now, which I think is, is cost effective uh, today for a variety of things. Um, Kevin Kelly uh, documented uh, how long it takes for new technologies in general, this includes crossbows and so forth, uh, to get to, to be banned and then the ban to be released. It's almost inevitable that uh, technologies like, you know, really dangerous technologies like railroads and, uh, and uh, automobiles would be uh, uh, controversial. And then, but the time that it's taking before they become uncontroversial is shrinking. This isn't to say that we shouldn't have controversy and discussion, it's just what, where, where are we going? It's to describe where we're going. Now these are three uh, types of uh, technologies that I was intimately involved in. Each one of them had some sort of controversy uh, and, and some sort of response. So controversy being the bold one and the response and, and I'm, I'm making the very casual, not well documented uh, argument that in some cases these were not deterrents to uh, progress. Uh, they were good conversations that, if anything, accelerated uh, the field. So the recombinant DNA was sort of 1974. A um, lot of this got a lot of uh, attention, you know, covers of you know Time magazine and things like that, and. Uh, almost instantly Genentech, Biogen, and Amgen, and a variety of other biotechs uh, uh, got investors because the investors said, oh, it's controversial, there must be something here, let's take a closer look. A uh, similar thing happened in 1991 where the NIH uh, actually started the controversy uh, by patenting a lot of cDNAs uh, that Craig Venter's group had done back when he had a small NIH lab. And the lawyers had just said, this is what we do. We, we patent things that come out of the NIH labs. And, and then people said, well, you can't patent cDNAs. That's the, you, know, the, you haven't added much value to it. They're, they're natural uh, uh, pieces of DNA. Uh, we now see that cDNAs are patentable, but I would, I would argue that there wasn't much at value added to these. And the controversy resulted in a great deal of attention and, and almost immediately the, the, that research moved out of NIH to human genome sciences and, uh, and genome therapeutics, uh, uh, a company that I was uh, helping out get, getting early DNA sequencing going. Uh, human embryonic stem cell, there were lots of restrictions um, in the United States especially. This resulted, I think, in, in I, I don't, I'm, I can't say for sure, but I doubt that California would have coughed up quite that much money if there had not been that much controversy and frustration among the California uh, biologists. And they sort of saw this as an opportunity to redo, to do another Silicon Valley, to make a uh, stem cell valley. Um, and then there were these various uh, successes. Now augmentation is something that often comes up with, uh, with with uh, genetics, and we all put aside all the augmentations that we've made that make us unnatural as a species. We're extremely unnatural species. Uh, we have, uh, ignore all the numbers, they're a little bit out of alignment, but the point is we, 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 vi where we have senses that go over a much broader range than they used to, uh, or they would in the, in the in we, we are, our ability to access uh, uh, Retrieve information is, is vast because of our computers and our cell phones, uh, access to them. We can uh, go at vast speeds into space, um, into the depths of the ocean and so forth. 
And you can see it's, it, and many of these technologies take a fairly short time, not just through the interdiction uh, process, but just through the cost curve to get broadly distributed. Not always in the um, optimal way. I mean, so here's transportation and cell phones. But the point is they can have a huge impact and they can be commoditized uh, uh, worldwide where you can have microfinancing and uh, where, where people uh, uh, get huge uh, benefit from fairly modest access to electronics. So are we genetically engineering human beings? And the answer is definitely. We've been doing it for quite a while. And this is uh, you know, a, 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 a summary of where we stand in terms of gene therapy trials, which is one of various ways that we are modifying human beings. These are, uh, for the most part, adults. There are some of these are our children. Uh, and they're in phase one, two, and three clinical trials. There's one that's been approved in Europe called Glybera. It is, right now, the most expensive pharmaceutical ever at $1.6 million per dose. Um, but as orphan drugs go, that's actually uh, about right uh, because you only need one dose. Um, and it, and it shows a, a general acceptance of this kind of human genetic modification in Europe, which, if any, which you know, has a reputation for being skeptical about such things. Uh, and it has to do with the, 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 the seriousness of the diseases that are being treated. So uh, the, the key here is not so much ethics as uh, safety and efficacy. It's the standard by which the Food and Drug Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency go by if it's safe and very effective and it's addressing a real problem. Now the most extreme and interesting form of those 2,000 or so genetic therapies that are in clinical trials to me is this highly targeted gene therapy. Most of those on that, on that previous slide are adding a gene, compensating for, for a missing gene uh, uh, a def, you know, a, a complete loss of, of function. And so you can add it pretty much anywhere. You can integrate it randomly, which has certain risks associated, or you can not integrate it, uh, but it's adding. But you can also subtract, or you can specifically modify. You can, you can use uh, uh, endonucleases that are, that are programmable, that is to say, you can target them to find a needle in a haystack, that one base pair out of six billion in your genome that you want to change. And in this case, this is kind of, uh, this is the earliest of these that's making it through uh, clinical trials. Sangamo is in sort of phase one, phase two clinical trials on, and you delete or damage both copies of the CCR5 gene and you end up with, uh, in the T cells from a person, you can take them out of the person, manipulate them, and put them back in. That means there'll be no graft rejection, no need for immunosuppressants. Um, and they now, now, they have now, the ones that have taken up this uh, zinc finger nuclease, this specific uh, targeted in nuclease, uh, those cells, those T cells have been doubly uh, knocked out of the CCR5 gene are now resistant to the, uh, to the AIDS virus. And this can be done in patients that are uh, resistant to AIDS, Oh, sorry, that already have uh, full-blown AIDS. And, uh, and so again, this is a, a very uh, promising uh, for very severe uh, diseases. We have uh, a project to uh, study personalized medicine in its broadest sense, ranging from, the, the, uh, f ranging from uh, carrier status, uh, newborn screening, you know, uh, all, all aspects of modern human genetics that works quite well to new uh, personalized medicines that include microbiomics and, and complicated uh, fa multi-factors to get this multi-factor data set, this large data set about individual people, not about cohorts, but really N of one, lots of N of one studies. We have this open access data that requires uh, consent that shows that people really know what they're getting into in terms of the possibility that their, uh, the probability that their data will be publicly available. We have stem cells uh, for uh, many of these individuals and a variety of uh, tests that can be done. And this, uh, this, sort, uh, this sort of stem cells that come out of this 
are a little piece of the uh, brain initiative that, uh, that, we, that, that you heard just a moment ago, where you can take these stem cells, reprogram them into neurons, and then they can have this kind of neurophysiology, uh, and, it, and it can be done in very short uh, developmental time frames. So we're getting to the point, another uh, kind of brave new world issue, where we can not only uh, manipulate human genomes, but we can manipulate human brains. We can either program them in C2 uh, with these innovative neurotechnologies, or we can build brains outside of the body and get this kind of spiking behavior on neural nets. Uh, this brain initiative was partially uh, instigated by this group of six people that I was part of in uh, 2012. And it was really remarkable how quickly it went from that uh, semi-obscure uh, 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 forward-looking piece in Neuron to an announcement by Barack Obama that we had a brain initiative. We, uh, I mentioned nucleases that you can target, you can program to find the needle in a haystack of the human genome or, e or other genomes. There are a variety of ways of making these nucleases uh, very specifically. But they can be targeted not just uh, in the human genome, but into wild genomes. We've, uh, we know that we're releasing um, genetically modified organisms into the wild for crops, for plants. Uh, there are a few animals that are being released into the wild. For example, Oxitec is releasing Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which have been engineered to be essentially like males have been sterilized by radiation, but in this case they've been sterilized by genetics. That seems like a fairly safe thing since the males don't suck blood and, and they are sterile um, as a special case. But you can see that the communities are warming up to the idea of releasing um, plants and animals into the environment. This would be the most extreme form of that and as a consequence, uh, Kevin Esfeldt, Andy Smidler, Flaminia Caterucia, and I uh, published uh, th three papers very recently uh, laying out this new form of gene drives, which uh, the basic idea goes back to Austin Burke in 2003 at least, but this is a CRISPR-based gene drive that's, a, that's so much easier probably to do uh, and uh, might be a, uh, something worthy of a cautionary tale, something worthy of uh, being very thoughtful about because it is so enticing and because it is so easy to do that even individuals might be able to do it. So now is the time to talk about it before we go much further. Now since we published these papers, uh, we've already now done it, uh, experiments on gene drives. This is not published in, in yeast. Uh, we've done it uh, at, in yeast because they have such a rapid generation time. This, this method is directed at uh, s sexual transmission where you cor can correct uh, spread a, a desired package through a, a wild population, or in this case, a laboratory population, exponentially, so all the offspring have it. Um, and and the, the experiment in yeast has uh, been very, um, it's, it's been close to 100%. This is the kind of the sim simple version of how it spreads. This is decidedly not like the Gregor Mendel peas that we saw a few slides ago uh, in, previous, in uh, Paul's talk. Uh, this is something where Essentially, you introduce one or a few mosquitoes into the population that have the gene drive and it spreads exponentially to all of their offspring and all of their offspring's uh, subsequent matings until it is uh, throughout the population. And it can spread packages such as uh, resistance of the mosquito to malaria. So you're not actually hurting the mosquito, but uh, you're making them so they no longer can be uh, vectors for malaria. Or you could make it so that there's a little, uh, that, that, that you only get transmission of, of the Y chromosome, in which case you'll eventually result in decrease in the mosquito population. This is a little more technical of how that, what's happening behind the scenes, but you basically have the, the blue cassette uh, in the upper uh, left that Hat that is on one chromosome in one specific position. So this is selfish DNA. It's not DNA that is uh, wildly replicating all over the chromosome, every chromosome, uh, hence producing a huge burden on the, 
on the mosquito or whatever species you're dealing with, or invasive or, or vector species. But it's in one place, in one chromosome, that you've decided is the best place. And then if it, when in the embryo, uh, if it finds that that same place in the, in the chromosome from the other parent is uh, different, doesn't have the cassette, then we'll move the cassette over into that by making a cut, makes a double strand break, and the cassette moves into it. And now you either have both copies, all the copies of that particular chromosome looking the same, or perhaps you've, you've mutated. But either way, all the offspring that survive have uh, the cassette that you want. And, you know, forget the details of this, but the important thing is there are very sophisticated things you can do with this new technology, this CRISPR technology, that allows you to be very specific to target subspecies. Um, so you have not only the, the, the species mating behavior and geographical barriers, but you have this genomic barrier that you can engineer so that you can um, make sure that the, the cutting is efficient and specific and, and even subspecies specific. You can do immunization either against gene drives or against natural uh, components like viruses, and you can even make reversal drives. I will make the argument that, that we are poorly adapted to our current environment. I, I mean, uh, we did not evolve to, to uh, sit all day and uh, be exposed to giant amounts of really tasty food. <coughs> and, uh, and there are various uh, uh, opportunities that we have, which I would, you know, certainly are not eugenics and they're not even augmentation, in that we're dealing with diseases of civilization. We're, they're augmentation in a certain sense that we're putting things into our medicines or our gene therapies that deal with things we wouldn't have had to deal with uh, in the past, but we respond to these uh, in an emergency attitude because they are uh, uh, life-threatening. This changes again when we, uh, we go into new environments and, and our, our civilization keeps pushing itself into new places, such as space. In space, we have problems with uh, with uh, osteoporosis uh, due to the lack of gravity. We have extreme radiation problems. Now some of these have uh, corresponding uh, problems on Earth. Uh, there are problems with the inner ear. There's problems with uh, uh, special uh, stresses that occur there and so forth. When we deal with these uh, situations, we have uh, we worry about multigenics. That is to say, how can we possibly understand something as complicated as height uh, when there are now 700 genes that affect it and they have very tiny effect sizes. What's uh, important, and you find it from projects like the, the Personal Genome Project, where you can correlate uh, traits with, uh, with gen genomes, is looking at the extremes. We talked about the bell curve. This is a different kind of bell curve, where you look way out at the, the shortest and the, and the tallest people as an example of many different uh, traits, both medical and non-medical. And you see out at those extremes, you get things that are called epistatic uh, genes, uh, variants that are so powerful that they dominate the uh, epistatically all of those small effects, including some small environmental effects, some small genetic effects. So to such a, and these suggest uh, uh, cures as well, or treatments that, that will influence th these very complex uh, uh, genetic and, and environmental traits. So if you give growth hormone to a, 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 a young person, maybe even at an age where growth should be stopping, growth will continue and uh, their stature will approach uh, whatever stature or goal they've had. So this is, this is an example of something where you can have what looks like a very complex genetics with fairly simple uh, consequences. Um, not that anything about medicine is simple. You also have this, you, you will often have cases where you have one person on the planet uh, at any given moment where you've learned it, that, that you don't have huge statistics here. You have a cohort size of one. Nevertheless, you can uh, prove causality by making animal models in some cases, some cases making human uh, in vitro organ models. And 
these you could consider rare protective alleles. These are things, like in this case myostatin, you get a double null, meaning missing both uh, copies. And at more or less at birth, uh, this child was, uh, had a high musculature, uh, as, as you can see reflected in the animal models. And there are many of these. All of these are, you know, none of these are unmitigated, you know, uh, protective variants that have no downside, but they have interesting uh, possibilities. Some of these uh, I, I mentioned in the context of imagining that they could be uh, useful to deal with uh, diseases of civilization or new uh, environments such as space. So for example, there are LRP variants. Um, this is a heterozygote, uh, which have extra strong bones. I've already mentioned growth hormone. Um, you might want to have smaller people in space. Uh, 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 the, you have insensitivity to pain. You have uh, odor might be a problem in space. Uh, you can have multivirus resistance, low coronary artery disease, and so forth. These are floating around in our population. Many of them, minus or minuses, are double nulls. These are genes that are conserved among all uh, animals, but they're missing in human beings, and they're not only alive, in, in many cases they're thriving. A possibly extreme example of this are people who live past 110 years. This slide is not an advocacy of smoking and drinking to excess. Uh, <laughs> But the point is, it's probably not solely that they have a great environment. Uh, they may actually have some exceptional genes. And, and so we're studying their genomes and trying to test hypotheses about them. Uh, you know, wrapping up here, uh, we, as we go into space, we need uh, to study uh, biospheres, how, how, uh, how our environment interacts with our uh, genetics. Uh, in more detail, I've already mentioned cosmic radiation. There are organisms that are very distantly related to us that are radiation resistant. And you might say, how, how irrelevant can that possibly be? We, how, how many mutations would that take? Well, it turns out you can change with as few as four mutations uh, an organism to be 100,000 times more radiation resistant. Whether this applies to humans is still unknown. And I'm just going to end on this. A uh, very playful and speculative slide. Um, this is a typical operating room. Uh, we will have to make a decision as we go into uh, new environments outside of Earth whether we want to drag along with us all our pathogens. Uh, uh, you know, it's, we can or we can't. It's, it's, it's up to us. But I consider that part of genome engineering is what, uh, how we interact with the, the huge part of our genome, which is in our microbiome. And I, I mentioned that there are people that are, uh, have insensitivity to pain. You could engineer this uh, such that it could be turned on and off. And so rather than going into uh, general anesthesia with its risks or opiate type uh, uh, um, analgesics, uh, you could have something like this. So I uh, thank you and time for questions, I hope. <laughs>